Uh, greetings. Uh, greetings from uh, my home church, uh, churches of Eugene and uh, Salem, Oregon, and uh, and uh, greetings on behalf of the uh, the wonderful Western region that we're all a part of. Um, it's a privilege to be here. This is the first time I've been here. Up the you know the beautiful. I, I just do you guys really ever pay attention to to Burmy or do you just look out the window? It's just like really cool out there. Um, we uh, we had a we had a conference in. Um, in uh, Portland a few years back, and they set the room up so that you could look at the river. And unfortunately, it was fishing season, and every time somebody caught a salmon in the river out there, whoever was speaking might as well have just quit at that point in time, because everybody is... And I know Dan Rogers got a little little frustrated at that. We, we changed the seating arrangements um, on that. But uh, it's it's a it's a privilege to be here. One of the one of the blessings of my job is that I get to travel around. I get to uh, I get to experience a lot of our different congregations. And you know, and the um, the last time I attended a, a, a congregational service in in Glendora, Carton Catherine Wood was preaching. So it's it's been a, been a while, but uh, been around a little bit. I, I had the uh, the privilege to go back to uh, Youngstown, Ohio, the, the church I grew up in as as a as a teen, and and to come back and to get to speak to them as you know, as a as a regional pastor and, and involved it. I, I really only went for one reason, and that was to remind him how many times they disfellowship me as a teen. Um, just kind of point that I was a bad influence, apparently. Um, not sure that's changed, but um, and I did I did confess to the fact that uh, 42 years ago I was the one that carved the initials on the chair in the back row of the uh, the you know. I had to, had to get that off my chest, but I get the um, I get the opportunity to, to to go to a lot of different places, and and in some cases, you know, there's just this thing uh, about being part of GCI. The service may look different, the, the music may look different. Um, we got, if, you know, if you were looking at the service that happened in my, for example, my Eugene congregation today, there would there would have been about you know eight instruments up here and and uh, a little bit. I wore my Jerry Garcia um, next time, but you know. <laughs> They're a little more out there, a little more, um, uh, well, let's just go with out there. Um, <laughs> you know, but then, I, you know, I'm in congregations that, you know, that the, the worship is, is with a CD. I really appreciated the worship today. Love loved the songs, love the selection. Um, I really enjoyed that. You know, and, and even in, I was in one of our congregations where the worship set was, um, was, a, was, a, was an elderly lady on a small Casio keyboard. Um, which is really cool for worship, except she used the drums setting on it. Um, you know, that's that's very strange to start be thou my vision. To <laughs> it's just a little strange, but um, but again, it's GCI. You're a part of something, and and it's just that 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 sense of unity. Um, now, I've not been here before, but anybody who's, um, anybody who's Facebook friends of, of Burmy is going to see pictures of pretty much everything that, that happens. So, uh, you know, I, I know what services you're having, who's doing what, where. And then being Facebook friends, Facebook is really that wonderful connection, and I'm Facebook friended with, um, with several people here. I get to follow along in their lives, although Regina's blog, I'm now worried that my pores are too large, but I'm still trying to deal with that. But... Um, the, the skin tips are good, but you know, but it's that opportunity to to, to get to know everybody that, and to realize that we really are part of something so much bigger. The idea of we are GCI, we are Grace Communion International, it, uh, really resonates um, when when that that really took hold in um, in Orlando this last conference down there. It it's it's spread, and and I just love the fact that wherever I'm at, I. That's the fundamental truth. We are GCI, regardless of what we look like, what we what we do, where we dress. I I, I wore a necktie today. Um, Eugene, I preach in blue jeans and a, and a tie dye T-shirt. And if I show up in a tie and suit, they know somebody died. So you know, it, we have the, the different. And then I also been in some of our congregations where this would be you know horribly, horribly underdressed. That doesn't matter. None of that matters how the worship looks, how we do, it's that fundamental truth that we have in Jesus Christ that we've come to understand who God is through through Jesus. And that, that is so important and I get to be a part of that. And that is that is the blessing I have. I do wanna I wanna continue a, 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 along the lines of, of where Jillian um, took us because I was I was very impressed in the in the uh, in the direction she led us. I um, I wanna set it up though um, this way. If we um, we opened we opened with a beautiful beautiful old hymn, and um, 
We, ne we never do all 12 verses of that, by the way. That's, that is just an absolutely <laughs> epic tome. Um, and uh, it, was, it was written by, um, um, uh, forgive me, I don't remember now, Dutch, Danish, I don't, one of those Scandinavian countries, um, uh, who was trapped in a storm and, and in a pavilion and, and was just saw the majesty of this incredible storm and began to put pen to paper and didn't know when to stop. But uh, <laughs> It's a beautiful, beautiful hymn. But here's the whole thing. It was on the screen. It was up here. And that was wonderful. But I have to look around, and I'm seeing, um, you know, I'm seeing white hair, and I'm seeing a, a bit of bit of history in this room as well. I have to believe that that if you just simply started out with those very first lines, "Oh Lord, my God, when I an awesome wonder," you guys could take it from there, couldn't you? And you could probably do the whole song. All you would need is that one line at the beginning you know it, you know if I if I start out with amazing grace how sweet the sound the saved a wretch like me yeah you're, you're you're going to know and know the rest of the song based on that first line of that song I was surprised and um, I spoke yesterday in LA and and I, I thought I'd really test him so I threw out um, you know hey kids shake it loose together the spotlights hitting something that's been known to change the weather and I was amazed at how many people got Elton John's Bert and Benny and the Jets out of that and, and knew, the, knew the lines on it um, we we don't need a lot. I was going to do my. Uh, I was going to do the first line from from Iggy Azalea and one of my favorite rap songs. But then I was afraid Eric would start singing fancy, and I just didn't want to go there. So, um, but those that first line takes us someplace. Well, I want to. I want to remind us of, of a story that's very fitting for this time of, of, of year, this season that we've just come through. Because we've just come through Holy, Holy Week, and you've, you've heard about some of the final words of, of Jesus. You've heard about that story. We rehearse it. And, and I use that term intentionally. We rehearse these events. They are significant to us. And we need to be reminded. Because after all, God was very big on, on that throughout, throughout all of the Old Testament. There were events to, to rehearse and to remind. And they were usually revolving around harvest and, and planting and festivals. But they reminded us of who God was and what God did and what God provided. And we, we have, you know, the various events of Jesus' life. And we rehearse them. And, in, and we're told in, in one case, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so... When we come to Holy Week and we go through, and you know, I get these people, um, I get it in my congregation. I think I don't know if you guys do. We get the creasters, those that only show up at Christmas and Easter, um, you know, and uh, you know, and comment. And I, you know, when I have somebody tell me, you know, you know, Pastor, every time I come here, you're either talking about the birth or the death of Jesus. <laughs> okay, um, <coughs> you might. I don't know. I'm in October. I don't, but um, but we uh, we'll go through these over and over. People go, oh no, we're going to do the same thing. It's Advent season, so for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about love and peace and joy and all that other stuff. You know, yes, we are, because we rehearse these things. So when we come through Holy Week and we rehearse this and we go back and and and, and in particular when we get to aspects of the crucifixion, those get uncomfortable for us, don't they? And they should. These are the kind of things that we're looking into one of the most, you know, one of the most despicable ways of, of executing somebody. And you know, and the, and the Romans didn't figure it out. The Phoenicians did, and the Romans just picked it up because it was nastier than the stuff the Romans were doing. And if they could find something nastier, they did it. And there were actually worse things after that style of crucifixion because the Romans perfected the fine art of killing people slowly. But we look at that, and we look to the cross. We look to the significance of it. I, I grew up, and some of you did, grew up in a, in a mindset that Jesus wasn't crucified on a cross. He was crucified on an upright stake. We know historically that's not accurate. We know also historically that he didn't drag the whole giant monstrous cross through the streets with him. It would have been the cross member, but we understand the mechanism of crucifixion. It was well documented, um, and it wasn't a one-off event. There were, you know, at, at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, there were stakes all over that hill up there because it was a common way of executing people. And, and I, I want to take us there for just a moment because there's, um, there's a line in Scripture, there's a, a passage in Scripture that I have heard misused so many times in sermons and have to confess have misused it so many times in sermons over the years. 
I was wrong. We were wrong. I listen to pastors constantly who are wrong in how we interpret this one little piece of scripture. Because we miss the fact that it's the first line of a song. We miss the fact that it is the beginning of something much longer. And we take it at face value. Um, you'll, you'll run into it, for example, in, um, what's another um, song, a Townsend song? Um, uh, well, how the title of that, How Deep the Father's Love, How Vast Beyond All Measure That He Should Send His Only Son to Make a Wretched Treasure. How great the pain of searing loss the Father turned His face away. We have banished that line. We still sing the song. It's a beautiful song. But we changed that line when we sing it in, in my congregations to the Father will never turn His face away. Away. And the reason is because that's the fundamental truth we see in Scripture. But the reason that people write that, and the reason we get this idea is that, that when God, when, when all of the sin of humanity, yours, mine, sins to be committed, sins to, all of humanity's sins are placed on the head of Jesus Christ on that cross, we have this concept that the Father could not look upon that, and so the Father turns his face away and at that moment at the fifth hour as we read in two of the gospel accounts Jesus looks to the sky and he cries out in Arabic um, Aramaic um, Ila, Ila, lama sabachthani. my God my God why have you forsaken me and, and we see that as one of the, the, the bleakest darkest moments of the crucifixion and we empathize with it because it's too easy for us to feel that same way. Like Jillian thinking, well, you know, yes, my, my, you know, my dad's brought us into the desert of Utah to die. <laughs> um, we too easily feel that because of our sins and our shortcomings that there are times, there are moments when the father simply turns his face away, when he can't look upon. It's too easy to buy into that lie. Because we read that passage and we, we, we make a simple assumption. If God the Father, in His infinite love, by definition, love, if the Father could turn His face away from the Son because of sin, His Son, this is my Son, who, who I love, this is... God incarnate can turn his face away. What's to keep him from turning his face away from us? What's to keep him from, from um, just, I'm um, sorry. If you're doing that, I just, I can't, I can't even look at you right now. And we buy into that. And here's the problem. That's not what that passage is about. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not looking into the heavens and, and, and seeing some image and vision that we can't see of, 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 of the Father and the Heavenly Father going, yep, can't do it. Can't do it. Can't look at it. That's not happening at that moment. So what is? What is happening at that moment? Well, remember I said if we started out with Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound um, that saved a wretch like me, you guys could sing the entire rest of the song. Jesus is on a cross. We know he's on a cross because they break the legs of the other, um, other condemned criminals. And the reason they break the legs is so that they would suffocate. They couldn't just put them out of their misery and stab them with a spear. They break their legs and they suffocate. And the reason they suffocate, and this is how we know it's a cross and not an upright state, because you can hang somebody like this for days and it's not gonna, they're not going to suffocate. They're not going to like you, but they're not going to suffocate. You're in this position, doing this, and the only way you can breathe is to pull up onto nails and to push up onto nails to take every breath that you take and then slump back down again. If you're in that position, and I don't want to, I don't want to. We, we do that a lot during the uh, during the, the Good Friday services and stuff. We talk about the crucifixion. I don't want to dwell on that, other than the fact to just explain this. If you have to pull your entire weight up onto nails through your wrists to breathe, you're not preaching too many sermons. 
You're not singing entire psalms from the Old Testament. You're not going to be explaining to those at the foot of the cross what's going on and what's happening. Jesus' comments on the cross are simple, aren't they? I'm thirsty. Uh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Mother, where is your son? Son, behold your mother. Simple, short comments. And at the end, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Looks to the heavens, <laughs> takes another breath, and says, it is finished. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it is finished. Bracket one of the most beautiful psalms in the Old Testament. Psalm 22. Jesus isn't looking at the heavens and seeing the Father turn his face away because that's not the kind of relationship that the Father and the Son have. They exist eternally as we see in John 1.1. 1, 1, proston theon, face to face. Pros can only mean face to face. That's the relationship Father and Son have. Father's not going to turn his face away on, from the Son, particularly since the cross was planned before the foundations of the earth. This wasn't a, oh, a, a Hail Mary play. This was something that was orchestrated long in advance. And the Father knew full well. The Son knew full well. The Holy Spirit knows full well what is happening at that exact moment. And they are all participating in it. If you've seen the movie The Shack, and I realize it's a fictional movie, and some people like it, some people don't, but there's a scene in there where, where Mackenzie is frustrated and he's talking to the Father, and, and the Papa in, in here. Uh, but, well, if, if, you know, you abandoned me when my, my daughter was killed. So therefore, you know, it's no different when you abandon your son and, and Papa takes Mackenzie's hands and says, no, you don't get it. It was painful for all of us. We were all there. We were all in the middle of it. And as, and as Papa turns hands up, there's a scar. And the Son has a scar. And the Holy Spirit has a scar. This was not a case. This is, this is actually one of the most beautiful scenes in the entire crucifixion. We turn it into this horrible, terrible thing, but it is the most beautiful scene in the crucifixion. Now, in Psalm 22, if you go back to it, Psalm 22 starts out with those words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, that's about all Jesus is able to get out, pulling up and taking a breath. Down. But he doesn't need to do anything more because like hearing Amazing Grace, like hearing the beginnings of How Great Thou Art, or hearing the beginnings of um, First Things First, I'm the Realist, of Fancy, I don't care what the song is. Hearing those words, everything else fills in. In Psalm 22, because it speaks of first this despair and abandonment. God, why are you abandoning me? Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me so far from my cries of anguish? The Romans were occupying Israel, and Israel was feeling it. And they were feeling abandoned a bit. And so Psalm 22 was a psalm that they would have known by heart. They would have memorized it. Remember, they don't have a phone with them with, with 37 translations on it. They didn't have scrolls. That, you know, they were read in, in, you know, in the synagogue, but they memorized these passages. And Psalm 22 was well memorized by a Jew in that time period because you've got the Romans. Why, are, why aren't you hearing our cries? Why aren't you delivering us? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and I find no rest. And now here's the problem. If we only, I, I'm amazed at how many. I, I gave a sermon similar to this um, a couple of years ago, and I, um, I had a pastor, a Presbyterian pastor, who came in to join, because that's the, the church rented that building from a Presbyterian church. And the Presbyterian pastor came up to me in tears afterward, and he said, I don't know if I've ever read the second half of Psalm 22. All we ever focus on is the first half of the song. He said, the second half changes everything. Well, it does. The first half is pretty bleak. And we've all been there. We've probably been in that, you know. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to die out here in Arches National Park or maybe whatever your dry place is and you're crying out to God and you're not sure that your prayers are getting any farther than that ceiling. We, um... We've been there. We understand that. And so we read this and go, oh yeah, yep, 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 yep. I understand that. Been there, done that. He 
goes on and he says, the psalmist goes on, you're enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises in our ancestors. Our ancestors put our trust. They trusted in you and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. You know, you, they cried out and you gave them water. They cried out and you freed them from them. They cried out and you fed them. And so the psalmist is going, wait a minute, you did all these incredible things. Why aren't you doing them for us? And it's easy for us to get into that thing. But now we begin to shift into the Christophany. And a Christophany, something that speaks to an event in Christ's life, but it was written long, long before that. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. Okay, the, the person standing, the Jew standing at the foot of the cross hearing this, is going, oh, wait a minute, yeah, he's... There's Jesus himself, Psalm 22. He's hanging on a cross. His, you know, he's not way up in the big pole, up in the thing like we like to see in these images. Crucifixions happen just off the ground. Feet were just slightly, maybe a foot off the ground. And the reason was it made it easier for people to ridicule, to spit on, to touch, to, to mock. And they're looking at it and going, wow, yeah. I'm mocked by uh, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults. They shake their heads. He trusts the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Now the Jews are going, wait a minute, we're hearing those same things being said by, by, by some of the, the, the Jewish leaders standing around going, ha ha, look at him. You know, let him cry out to his God. This is starting to make sense to them. Yet you brought me out of the womb, you made me trust even in, in my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help goes on in verse 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It's melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shard. What's one of the lines from Jesus? I am thirsty. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth and you let me lay in the dust. Dogs surround me and they pop pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. What's this almost writing about, by the way? Because crucifixion doesn't exist in David's day. And yet, here is Jesus, nailed hands and feet to a cross. Talk about a Christophany. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide, divide my clothes among them and they cast lots for my garments. What does the gospel account say? That they give away his outer garments, but that his inner garment is, is woven from a single piece of fabric. And so the Roman guards underneath it are, are casting lots over this garment. Wait a minute, it was prophesied in, in a psalm written by David long before that. Those people around him went, oh my word, this is Psalm 22. He's living out Psalm 22. We need to pay attention. But you, Lord, do not be far from me, for you are my strength. Come quickly and help me. If we ended it right there, it's despair. It's depressing. It's, oh. But it doesn't end right there. Psalm 22 goes on. If we drop down and, well, it says, I will declare your name in the assembly and I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. Here we go. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Doesn't the Father turn his face away? Doesn't the Father abandon Jesus? Doesn't the Father, I can't look at the sins? No, he says he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face, and other translations actually say, has not turned his face away from him, but has listened to his cry for help. So we get this image where, you know, wait a minute. We're not... The Father's not turning his face away. Jesus isn't crying out in despair. Jesus is saying, read Psalm 22, and you'll know what's going on here. The Father's not abandoned me. Nobody's taken anything away from me. It's all good. Not only is it all good, but if you run down to the very end of the psalm, and the rest of it is a psalm of encouragement, it says they will proclaim, posterity will serve him, verse 30. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. That passage right there, he has done it, can also be translated, he has finished it. 
What is Jesus' final words on the cross? It is finished. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? First line of Psalm 22. It is finished. Last line of Psalm 22. The encouragement that we can take away from the fact that we have a Father who loves us so much that He will never turn His face away from us. Regardless of what we do, what we fall into, what our sins are, His love is so supreme that in the face of all of that, we exist with Him, prostantian, face to face. Nothing, we're told. And there's a long list of things that pretty much accomplishes everything. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. And Jesus' final words to us. And they apply in, in the good times, and they uh, apply when we're wandering in the desert thirsty. I will never leave you or forsake you, even to the ends of the age. What too often we've interpreted as, as, a, as a dark, despairing passage, I present to you, is actually the most encouraging and joyous part of another rise rather dark and brutal moment. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for that revelation that you are the God of love and that in Christ, we now are seated in the heavenlies with you. We are in some way, because that's in present tense, we are in some way in, in a relationship with you that we can't comprehend at this moment because you're God and we're not. But when we put our trust in you, when we realize that, that, that you will lead us through, that, that you will provide, in, in, and we start out as we heard trusting you in the, in the simple things and realizing that you are God. When we know that and we know that that love will never be withdrawn from us, that you will never turn your face away, just as you did not turn your face away from your son, you will never turn your face away from us. And that we exist now in, in a way that we don't comprehend and will exist for eternity in glory, face to face with you. And in your love, we thank you and praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we all say Amen. Amen. Amen.